today, partly cloudy in the morning then becoming sunny. West winds around 15 miles an hour in the afternoon. Tonight, partly cloudy in the evening, lows in the middle of the city. West winds around 15 it's 8 miles an hour in the evening. Tuesday, cloudy in the morning then becoming partly cloudy. I'm not home, but my home knows I'm coming. <sighs> the internet is expanding, and as it does, it's giving us almost supernatural powers. Hmm. Alexa, you forgot to butter my toast. I'm not sure how to help you with that. The internet is no longer just a network of computers and servers. Now it's a network of things, things that know us. Things that know what we like to eat, how long we sleep, how to open our front doors, and even the rhythm of our heartbeats. Alexa, where are my keys? Your keys are in your bedroom. At 8.30 a.m. you have a meeting. The internet isn't just a cloud. Now it's got a body, a body of devices, limbs, eyes, ears, and even a brain. Each device we connect to the internet becomes part of it. But are these devices at our service? Or are they secretly pulling the strings? Today, the internet is everywhere, listening to us, influencing us, becoming part of us. But if the internet now has a body, how far can it reach? internet is an intelligence amplifier. But almost everything that you can think of a positive and beneficial use for, there's also a negative use for. Human beings, they don't end at the edges of our biological tissue. Tools are appendages, extensions of who we are, and those tools shape our behavior as much as we shape them. As things in our physical life start to be on the internet and interconnected, the number of things that could go wrong is just going to grow. Little robots are doing more things for us than we realize. There are now billions of network sensors. They make up what is called the Internet of Things. It's like watching the planet develop a nervous system. The merging of a lot of these technologies is going to lead to the first true machine intelligence. And then what? You never can be too careful. It's about us controlling the devices before the devices control us. But we'd never have our smart devices without the work of one man. Doug Engelbart. Doug Engelbart. Doug Engelbart. Doug Engelbart. Doug Engelbart. Doug was as monomaniacal as anybody I've ever met. Through his entire life, he was focused on one thing, intelligence augmentation. The notion was that human beings were well, pretty good, but with computers, we could be a lot better. He imagined networked computing in a way that was both highly technical and highly idealistic even utopian. If in your office you were supplied with a computer that was alive for you all day, instantly responsive to every action you had, how much value could you derive from that? It was in the fall of 1968 when Doug Engelbart staged what has come to be known as the mother of all demos. Come in Menlo Park. OK, there's Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. Several thousand computer engineers were in a hall and they saw Doug Engelbart up on a screen using a computer to communicate with people who were not in the same room. I'd like now to have us bring in Jeff Rulison from Menlo Park. He's sitting in one just like this, been working independently. Hi, Jeff. Oh. <laughs> and it was the first time many of them had ever seen computers as a true communication tool. Suddenly, 
At that moment, that room full of people began to imagine not just computers, but computer networks. Engelbart is actually the person who invents the computer mouse. It was kind of like um, a little wooden box that you could move around with your hand. You think about that for a moment. It's something that really accommodates the computer to the human body, to the human hand. You can see the devices that I'm using. Dug in. A portrait mode display, black on white, so it looked like a piece of paper. It'll copy it. He invented a mouse so you could point to things on the screen. It's controls through a potentiometer. He invented hyperlinks so that you could connect a document to another document. If I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that, and oh, I see, overdue books and all. This was a system which, for all practical purposes, was a World Wide Web in a box. Thank you very much for coming to the dedication ceremonies. Engelbart and his lab actually helped humanize the computer. The computer would bring us together, and by bringing us together, would let us be more fully human. Steve Jobs was the first one to really get this. We're tool builders, and that's what a computer is to me. It's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with, and it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. Three things, a widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. I remember when the iPhone was first announced back in 2007, I could absolutely not wait to get one. And when I finally did get my hands on one, it felt like I was living in the future. And now, I can hardly remember what it was like to live without this. It's a device made of plastic and metal that has all the answers, all the world's knowledge and information, that can summon cars, that can move mountains, that can make people do things, all by rubbing a magic mirror. And no place has embraced that magic more than Silicon Valley. Here, you see the smartphone everywhere. But it's also here that the next generation of smart devices is currently incubating. To see them, I'm paying a visit to Beta, Palo Alto's newest analog store for digital devices. Hi, welcome to Beta. Thank you. Have you been in before? I have not. I'm oh, Derek. Cool. I'm Katrina. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Everything here is out of the box, so you can touch it, feel it, interact with it, see how it's going to fit into your life. It's a Bluetooth-connected device, so you can create lightscapes. Bright day, a sunset, date night, movie night. You no longer have to carry your keys. You can control it directly from your app. 3D video viewing. Whoa. Any command that you would be able to give your phone, you can do through the button. It will automatically water for you. You can interact with it, you can touch it and talk to it. Put it on your keys, you can put it on your kid, your dog, your backpack, whatever. Now we're talking. I haven't, haven't crushed anything yet. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I want one. The beta store feels like a toy store for grown-ups. But as I was about to find out, it's less a store than a research lab, where they're collecting data about you. Our store was made to bring the best parts about the internet to brick and mortar retail. Although our store does sell products, we make no money from selling products, which is very unusual in the, in the brick and mortar world. In fact, we're the only store like that. How do you make a profit if you're not making any money off selling products? We have this really unique business model for retail where we directly rent space to companies and we partner with a company called Retail Next. Retail Next has figured out how to use computer vision from overhead cameras to understand how people shop in stores. At the beta store, the most important sensor isn't on the shelves. It's actually in the ceiling. 
As you interact with products, these cameras are watching you. Measuring how much time you spend at each station and learning what you like. And the customers don't know necessarily that they're being tracked or... If anything, like this is the most naive version of tracking out there. I came to Beta to look at smart devices, but I was surprised to discover that they were actually looking at me. To learn more about how smart cameras help retailers like Beta, I paid a visit to the maker of the sensor, Retail Next. Wouldn't it be great to know your shopper? To know what catches her eye? Introducing Aurora by Retail Next, the first all-in-one sensor designed specifically for the complex needs of retail. The next generation sensor for shopper measurement. So walk me through this. Uh, you know, someone comes into the store. What sorts of data could you tell about that person? You can tell a lot about the type of person coming into the store. male, female, approximate age. And you can capture a lot of information about their path through the store. Can I just back yeah. you up? How, how can you tell age and gender of the people walking into a store? Yeah, so it's using computer vision. It works very similar to how human eyes work, but it's all algorithms doing that automatically. If you want to understand the type of customer that shops a particular store at a particular time, can do that quite well. Retail Next cameras help retailers identify and target their best customers. But other analytics companies take facial recognition to a new level. The system does not need an exaggerated expression. The system can also detect micro expressions. Some use cameras that can tell how you feel about a product. whether you like it or not. But while cameras are very useful sensors for retailers, they're nothing compared to the one we have on us all the time, our smartphone. They want to use the unique identifiers that are associated with your cell phone to find out where you shop, how long you linger in which section of the store. For retailers, your smartphone is like your digital fingerprint. It tells them if you've visited their store before and when you were there last. If 10 years ago someone said to you, would you mind if I planted a little tracking device on you that would tell me where you are, what you're reading, what you're spending money on, who you're talking to, and what you're doing 24 hours a day, would that be okay? And you'd say, hell no, are you kidding? I, I would never let you do that. Now people sleep in front of the Apple store for three days for the privilege of buying an $800 sensor that does exactly that and a lot more. Retail Next insists that while they don't ask permission to track you, your data is completely anonymous unless you opt in. If you opt in, you've let companies know exactly who you are and they can now track and target you in real time. But this kind of tracking didn't begin in stores. It began online. Online retailers don't have cameras and sensors to track you. They don't need them. They have something better. The cookie. So what exactly is a cookie? And how do companies use it to track us? To find out, I spoke to this guy. That's good. Mm -hmm. Lou Montulli invented the cookie in 1994. The concept's a little bit like a fortune wrapped in a cookie. A cookie is a file, and the fortune inside is a unique string of text. You can't read it, but websites can. Each time you visit, websites place cookies on your computer. These bite-sized files help websites remember you. This is what allows you to do things like shopping carts. You get this fortune cookie and you hold onto the cookie and you don't, you don't know what's inside of it, you really don't. 
you really don't care. And when you visit the website again, you give the cookie back and the website breaks it open, reads the message, says, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> You're the guy who wanted to purchase the toaster and I'll put that in your shopping cart. That was the idea. Harmless, right? Something unforeseen happened. It didn't take long before advertisers noticed cookies. And ad networks started using them to track us. You start this really terrible arms race. And the arms race is to know as much about you as possible. They could target advertisements in a way that never worked on TV. Because the TV is a medium that you watch. The internet is a medium that watches you as you watch it. Today, every move you make online, each cookie you receive, it becomes part of a virtual profile, or a dossier, of you. These profiles include information we don't even think of ourselves as leaking. I wear a Fitbit, so I'm trying to lose some weight. And what that means is a couple times a day, I am reporting my physical activity levels to Fitbit, which may well be aggregating and selling my data to people who want to put me on diet plans. You get this sort of three-dimensional picture of somebody we can actually predict what they're going to do. They now can find out exactly who's most susceptible to being manipulated into buying various products. There are con men that are looking for older people, and they know that that person has been online looking at places to invest money and how to best retire. They'd get the phone call and invest your life savings in this new stock. So if you have all that data, you could target somebody who is in a weakened state. That's the danger right now. But the emergence of these virtual dossiers was predicted long ago. This educational film from 1967 lays out a future all too familiar. By the year 2000, computers will invade our privacy on a scale hardly imaginable. They will be interconnected, and unless prevented by new legislation, will be able to sell information on where we travel, how much we spend, and in what restaurants and hotels, whether and when we pay our bills, what we do with our evenings, and with whom. There will be 20 typewritten pages of dossier on each of 230 million citizens in North America. Today, your dossier has all this information and much, much more. But the company with the most valuable dossier is one you probably use every day, Google. Google knows a lot about us because Google knows our intentions. And when we think about the world of advertising, intention-based advertising tends to be the stuff that actually works. It was not so long ago that people were saying, how does anyone think this company can make money by giving away search? It was considered a, a, a silly idea. Google's massive ad network, which includes pop-ups, generates billions of dollars for the company every month. In fact, 90% of the company's revenue comes from ads. And Google only gets paid if people click. Now, most of the web pages that you visit on the internet allow Google to track you. Most people love YouTube, I love YouTube. Why do they purchase YouTube? Because it gives them more information. Why did they develop Chrome, a browser? Why did they develop Android, an operating system? They're collecting information on us on more than 60 different platforms and we are completely oblivious. When was the last time you read a 60-page user agreement? My guess is you probably just clicked, I agree. I certainly do. And when we aren't actively online, it's easy to forget that the Internet of Things is still watching us. 
everywhere you go, even when you're not actively using your phone, it's still listening. Companies are finding very clever ways to get us engaged in helping them with their businesses. And if they can't get us, they're asking our devices to do it. The devices that are going to inhabit our lives, not just cell phones, but your smart refrigerator, your smart car, all those things are basically going to be eavesdropping tools for someone. Maybe the most sinister of this um, is the talking Barbie doll. Introducing a whole new way to play with Barbie. There's now a Barbie doll that when you turn it on will find your Wi-Fi network and will use the cloud to have a conversation with you about your interests. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a vet. That's wonderful. Wanting to take care of sick animals is an amazing goal. Hello Barbie is recording all these conversations and sending them to the cloud. I love New York, don't you? Tell me, what's your favorite part about the city? To me, this is basically a Barbie doll designed to interrogate an eight-year-old girl and get her to tell stories. What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I want to be a scientist. Eureka! A scientist. I think science is so amazing. Why do you want to be a scientist? Well, uh, I guess at school I really enjoyed chemistry and physics. The study of physics is incredible. Take gravity. You can't see it, but the second you trip, it's right there to pull you down. Did you ever fall or trip on something? <laughs> yes, I have definitely fallen down a number of times in my life, Barbie. It happens to me all the time. That's gravity, pulling you down, sometimes with an ouch. Wow, you sound to me like the next Marie Curie or Albert Einstein. Am I right? I think you are right, Barbie. I knew you were a smart cookie. As long as our devices work for corporations, they'll push us into being good consumers. But what if someday soon, our machines not only prompt us to buy, they also offer us a new form of currency, shares. We'll share our tastes, our interests, and even our private lives. Share your biometric data today, 500 points. Your biometric data indicates you didn't sleep well. Are you feeling okay? Lucy, does your boyfriend know? You're pregnant? However strange this may seem now, it will very quickly become the new normal. Today, the devices that connect us to the world also mine us for information. But none of this would be possible without a World War II era technology and the most beautiful woman in the world. The technology, of course, is wireless. But the woman? You are the man I think you are. You'll get Miss Hetty Lamar to seal it with a kiss. What about it, Hetty? Go ahead. Oh, no. By 1938, American audiences knew the Austrian actress Hetty Lamar as a dynamic and stunning leading lady. Funny, I don't have an ear for beauty, just an eye for it. But she was no ordinary movie star. I came here to ask you to marry me. She was an inventor. Hetty spent her evenings inventing an improved traffic light and a tablet that carbonated and flavored your water. But as she watched Europe descend into chaos, Hetty turned her attention to inventions that could help the war effort. It has a strange effect on me. How, she wondered, could radio transmissions be secured from enemy eavesdropping? Then 
she heard this, Ballet Mécanique. This music was written in 1924 by an avant-garde composer, George Antile, who saw it as a celebration of machines as music makers. His complex arrangement included three xylophones, four bass drums, three airplane propellers, and 16 player pianos. Player pianos used paper rolls with punch holes to generate the music. But ballet mechanique's rolls were special. They were synchronized. Hedy Lamarr realized that the synchronized paper rolls were just what she needed for her next invention, secure radio communication. Using player pianos as inspiration, she and Antile designed a system called frequency hopping, in which a secret message would hop across radio frequencies. To do this, the system used punch holes on a paper roll. But unlike a player piano, these holes wouldn't control musical notes, they'd instead control frequencies. The message would be sent in pieces. And on the receiving side, an identical paper roll would reassemble the message. She'd done it. Frequency hopping made radio transmissions impervious to eavesdropping. Hetty immediately donated her patent to the military. But the commanders weren't impressed. They turned up their noses at the idea of a secure system of paper rolls. Her invention lay dormant for decades. But Hetty had the right idea, and it was not lost on everyone forever. It was a hidden gold mine. Those who think getting a car phone is not for them, whatever the reason, haven't kept up with the booming industry of cellular radio telephones. In the 1980s, frequency hopping was finally declassified. And we quickly got the first cellular telephone. This Nokia Mobera portable cellular phone is just $5.95. Hedy Lamar's idea sparked a chain reaction an explosion of wireless devices. Since the year 2000, mobile data traffic has increased nearly 400 million times, and much of this growth has come in the developing world. The invention that Hetty hoped would save the world has instead transformed it. Cultures are now skipping a generation of technology developing cultures where there was no telephone, there was no running water, there was no electricity. Now you bring a cell phone into that village and its horizons expand uh, unimaginably. It will be a billion handsets in Africa in 2016, which is extraordinary. The poorest on the planet can afford a mobile phone. This idea of wireless mobility will change the way people think about themselves about national boundaries, about education, about almost everything. Wireless now covers the Earth almost like a layer of atmosphere. It's easier than ever before to stay connected. But are we really more connected to the people around us? What is the impact of technology on our daily lives? Interactions are being always mediated by a technological device. It is not all benign. It's getting noisier and noisier. You have to move away from the noise. What if you could live somewhere truly quiet without all the wireless noise? Welcome to the quiet zone. We're in the middle of what's called the National Radio Quiet Zone. And it's an area that is unique in North America. It's 13,000 square miles. About the size of Massachusetts and Connecticut combined. At the heart of the quiet zone lies the town of Greenbank, West Virginia, home of the largest steerable radio telescope in the world. The quiet zone was created to protect it. 
The Green Bank Telescope is a Swiss watch the size of a football stadium. But while it is so enormous, its tolerances are measured in fractions of a millimeter. We're talking about a, a telescope that stands taller than the Statue of Liberty. But the reflector surface is 2.3 acres in size. The bigger the bucket, the more raindrops you catch. Today, the telescope is on the cutting edge of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. In recent years, we've discovered, with the Green Bank Telescope, the basic organic molecules, the kind of things that, in some sense, are the building blocks of life floating out in the gas between the stars. But these discoveries come at a price. Radio silence for hundreds of miles in all directions. Unlike traditional telescopes, radio telescopes don't see, they listen for radio waves. In the 1950s, astronomers built the telescope here because it was a quiet place to do just that, listen. The observatory started in the 50s and they picked Green Bank specifically. They say we are the quietest place on earth, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe this is the last quiet place there is. <laughs> For Green Bank residents, this doesn't just mean radio silence, it means wireless silence. Yeah, so living in Green Bank does have its challenges. Can't have a cordless phone or get a cellular phone. There's no cell towers here. Wireless speakers, wireless headphones. Garage door openers cause problems. Electric fence around someone's garden. Microwaves. Bluetooth devices. Remote control cars. PS4s, Wii's. Uh, Nintendo's. It's the craziest things that you would never think would cause interference that do. But the telescope's biggest threat is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi here just completely overwhelms what we're trying to do. What's also amazing, though, is that we're beginning to interact with the internet as if it is the only other social being we have in our lives. And that is the dangerous part, I think. Mike's idea made me wonder, what about being a teenager in a disconnected town? Would you feel you're missing out? One of the girls that just recently moved to this school asked me when she first moved here if we had cell phone service. She was like, I can't get any service on my cell phone. I was like, you're not going to. This is Green Bank's middle school in the shadow of the Green Bank telescope. Say you're here, and then you go to like New York or Maryland. I mean, you staring see at people the just constantly. walking across the sidewalk. Yeah, they're just yeah. staring at their screens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Becky liked my status. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bob commented. I totally got to respond to that. I think honestly, if like the internet crashed here right now and we had no internet, we could survive. Real City people stuff. sit on the side of the road yeah. and wait for all these people to come get them, and we can get out and change our tire and get back in and go home like we need to. We don't have to call people on our cell phones. We actually drive to their house and knock on their front door. Like, yeah, yeah. I like I feel sometimes that we are the control population for a gigantic experiment being played on humanity by the telecommunications in industry. We are living without the benefits and distractions of cellular technology. I'm basically shocked at what I see. I see people standing next to one another, diddling with their little devices. It feels to me like, while I wasn't looking, the whole world took up cigarette smoking. Elsewhere, the internet is attached to you all of the time. Whether you're purposefully utilizing it or not, it's doing something with your device, even when it's in your pocket, but you're tethered to it. Here, you're not tethered to it. It's interesting to think that something special has happened here. But in fact, it's almost the opposite. It's something weird has happened everywhere else. <laughs> Green bankers may enjoy their radio silence, but for the rest of us, living without our mobile devices wouldn't just be unpleasant. It would be impossible. We are outsourcing our memories into these devices, and we're so dependent on them now. There's no backup system. Most college-age students say they can't go a day device-free. 
For many people, the cell phone has become a body appendage. They can't not be with it. Information is essentially their third skin. The library of all human knowledge is now just a screen away. We may think this means we're getting smarter, but we're relying more and more on machines to do the thinking for us. What used to be research has been replaced with search, Google search. In 1998, Larry Page and Sergey Brin launched Google to unravel the tangle of information on the web. They did this using algorithms. They used one algorithm to index the web and another one to rank the results from the billions of pages in the index. They gave you the ability to effectively search through every page of every book in the library. PageRank, Google's ranking algorithm, decided which page would be in the coveted first place. The more links you've got, the more PageRank score you get, but it could be that somebody could have fewer links, but from more important places, those links would count for more. And that was their secret sauce. PageRank worked so well that Google quickly became synonymous with search. But while search results often number in the millions or even billions, usually only 10 matter. Typically, you see 10 search results on the first page. 50% of our clicks go to the top two search results, 50%. And most people never look beyond the first page. But what we have begun to realize is that search rankings are impacting decisions people make about everything. We let Google decide what's the best information for us. But with millions of results that may match your query, why do you get these 10? Hey guys, today I wanted to give you my answer to the big question, how to rank number one in Google. When Google designed its algorithm, it inadvertently created a new industry, search engine optimization. Today we're going to talk about great SEO and what I believe Google wants. There's a new Google ranking factor that's huge right now. Really sneaky and really, really clever that tactic, so make sure you implement that. These experts have learned how to optimize a website's structure or content to make it a top result. The algorithm is the key to cracking Google. Now what if I told you? that we have cracked Google's formula. All too often, we focus on beating the Google bot rather than feeding the Google bot. Whether a website knows how to feed the Google bot might determine which brand of dog food you purchase. It may affect where you apply to college. And it could even impact an election. We believe that because it's a computer program, operating however it's happening. We can trust it. The algorithm has to put things into an order. So what if the algorithm itself ends up favoring one candidate over another? Is the activity on Google, in fact, creating more interest in a candidate and in turn, generating more votes? But this problem isn't limited to search engines. Facebook has run experiments manipulating the outcomes of elections. I mean, the way they do it is they can actually make you more likely to vote. If Facebook just sent out go out and vote reminders, but they sent them only to people of one political party, if they did that on voting day, they could easily flip an election. Backlash bring against Facebook. Former Facebook insider calling it, quote, absolutely biased. An article posted Monday said Facebook workers suppressed conservative-leaning news stories in its trending section. People thought this was outrageous because here's this neutral technical system and then opinionated humans were coming in and mucking with it. But that's an absurd way to look at these things. There are no neutral technological systems. Today, the most advanced algorithms are artificial intelligence programs called neural networks. Like dogs, these AIs aren't programmed, they're trained. A process called machine learning. 
toy duck. Yes, that is correct. The next generation of robots will learn like an insect or a baby. It'll bump into things. It'll learn how to walk, learn how to navigate into this world. Rather than having all the lessons programmed from the very start. But with machine learning, artificial intelligence is no longer fully under our control. When machines become as intelligent as we are, assuming that we are intelligent, any machine that can make decisions, choices, which can behave in a way which is not predictable by its designers, and there are many machines like this now. I'm thrilled to be here to introduce a brand new product. In 2015, Google released an AI program to organize photos. Using machine learning, Google Photos understands what's important and helps you by automatically organizing your memories. And was caught off guard when their algorithm labeled a photo of African Americans as gorillas. People who train these artificial intelligence systems train them on white people's faces. These weren't necessarily racist people, but their implicit biases of how they built and trained these systems end up embedding this incredibly set of racist assumptions. And just because a machine can learn from humans doesn't mean they'll teach it the right thing. As Microsoft learned from their chatbot Tay, humans love to corrupt AI. Hello, world. The more you talk, the smarter Tay gets. Microsoft designed Tay's software to mimic the speech patterns of 18 to 24-year-olds. Even the best algorithms make mistakes at scale. It did not take long for internet trolls to poison Tay's mind. Tay's designers trained the bot to improvise based on what people said to her. Algorithms are a lot more likely to make mistakes than people are. And they can also be tricked much more easily than people can. Soon Tay was ranting about Hitler, launching racist and anti-feminist attacks. These systems have amazing blind spots. This happens all the time. Algorithms are used for everything from college admissions, online dating, hiring decisions, loan approvals, stock market investments, through to studying influenza outbreaks and cancer research. A series of programming algorithms are making decisions without any of us having insight to how those decisions are being made. And that's a little bit scary. Machines are gonna be running my life and everyone else's. So I was curious to know how they learn. And here at MIT, they're learning something that up to now, only humans could do, drive. Welcome to Ducky Town. Ducky Town may look cute, but it's got a real mission, to test the challenges of driverless vehicles quickly with the safety of miniature scale. What's the advantage of researching autonomous vehicles in Ducky Town? So the idea here is that, well, now we have this city where we can deploy 50 of these things very easily in an afternoon, and we don't waste a lot of time with the logistical problems. But the research problems are still preserved. What it's doing right now is it's using the camera to identify the road lines. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets to an intersection, it reads the intersection sign mm -hmm. and then picks a random allowable direction to turn based on what it reads on the sign. What are the really hard problems to solve in making a truly autonomous vehicle? One big problem is that every piece of the environment has to be perceived somehow. And that includes pedestrians, cyclists, other cars, the hard part is being right about that 100% of the time to establish Liam scale. pointed me to all the problems that they haven't figured out just um, yet. Like Unpredictable humans, bad weather, detours, and what to do in the event of an unavoidable crash. Our self-driving cars have a lot to learn. But unlike us, they learn quickly, really quickly. 
There's this new idea that's very powerful in robotics called cloud robotics, which basically is the realization that you can interconnect every robot with the internet. So if you're a robot and you learn something, all of the robots will know immediately. That's learning that's very different than human learning. And it's not science fiction at all. It's already being deployed in the self-driving car world. Our robots today understand space. They understand their location in space, they can navigate in space, but not much more. But what happens when robots can do everything we can do? I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. With artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, yeah, you sure you can control the demon? <laughs> Didn't work out. We should not be confident in our ability to keep a super intelligent genie locked up in its bottle forever. Sooner or later, it will out. A super intelligent AI has the potential to tip the balance of power. If a cloud-based intelligence can communicate instantly, how will we humans maintain control? Hello. What? How are you? To find out more about machine intelligence, I decided to video conference with Kevin Warwick, professor of cybernetics at Coventry University. He's interested in merging human and machine intelligence to create a hybrid, a cyborg. What are your thoughts on artificial intelligence? Um, well, if you can't beat them, join them. So taking the very powerful artificial intelligence system and linking it to you. You become part of it, it becomes part of you. And so you take on board the power of AI rather than have it acting against you. Kevin explained that while humans and machines seem different, our minds both use electrical signals and binary code. Brain cells fire or they don't fire, just as artificial brain cells in the computer fire or don't fire. Each brain cell is a binary signal just like a computer. In fact, you can send brain signals across the internet as though it's your nervous system. Kevin doesn't just study the theoretical possibilities of using the internet as a nervous system. He's actually plugged himself in. In 2002, Kevin implanted an electrode array in his arm and connected it to a robotic hand over the internet, becoming the world's first cyborg. Whoa. I went to Columbia University in New York, and the guys there helped me plug my nervous system into the internet, and it linked to a robot hand in the UK. With the implant in place, linked to the internet, when I moved my hand in New York, the robot hand then moved from my brain signals in the UK. My brain was receiving signals back from the fingertips, and I was able to feel how much force the hand was applying on a different continent. <laughs> that is incredible. So with the internet and with an implant, your brain and your body don't have to be in the same place. That arm can be, I mean, ultimately, it can be on a different planet. Do you think that ultimately down the track that leads us to kind of meld our nervous systems in a big network? Oh, I hope so. Yes, I hope so, sincerely. This cybernetic network could help humans and machines understand each other better. I mean, when you look at how humans communicate and compare it to technology, I mean, you have to be embarrassed, frankly. It's, it's terrible. The interface, we're still using, even now, I'm using mechanical pressure waves to communicate. The co highly complex electrochemical signals in my brain, and then I convert those to these trivial coded pressure waves. It's terrible, really. I mean, we've got to get with the times. We have the technology now to upgrade humans, so we need to do it. Some call this upgrade the singularity. The point of no return. Since the birth of artificial intelligence, we've wondered when AI would catch up to us. Perhaps the time will come and we'll, we in the machines will sort of pass in opposite directions and there'll be a 
transition point and we can't decide whether it's a man in a machine or a machine in a man. But the question is, what will life be like after the singularity? You'll take a little pill. It will arrange itself, wire into your visual cortex, into your hearing system, to the rest of your brain, and, you know, put you on the internet. Welcome. Our brain will interact with all the chips in the room. We just walk into a room, mentally turn on the lights, mentally turn on the internet. Reminder, date at 9 p.m. Choose outfit. We simply blink and see all the information we need to know to conduct the, the day's business. going to start to change how we think of where we end and the world begins. Because more and more it's going to be, it's going to feel like each of us is living in our own personalized universe. We're all going to be enveloped by an AI software shell. You're going to give your AI permission to listen to every conversation you have, read all your emails, monitor all your, your biometric body data, and that AI's mission is to make your life better. But once the singularity arrives, machine intelligence will quickly be out of our control. As soon as a computer, in some sense, wakes up, because it has access through the internet, it has access to everything, all human knowledge, it will transform into something else. We do have a world of super smart robots. If we are very, very lucky, they will treat us like pets. However, if we're very, very unlucky, they will treat us like food. Me, I'm hoping for the pet scenario. I call the internet the internest. We have been building a nest for the first true machine intelligences that arise. talk about unintended consequences, you know, you end up with, uh, you know, maybe something that we think is going to be really good and that isn't. I think when you consider how reliant we are upon the invisible systems that surround us every day and provide us so much, we're at a fork in the road. What if the internet doesn't enslave us? What if instead it becomes our guiding light? From the moment we're born, we'll look to it for wisdom and beauty. It will see our strengths and foster them. It will guide us to realize our potential. And provide answers to our biggest questions. As humans, we have always yearned to understand our connection to the cosmos. Our place in the universe. Perhaps our greatest creation, the internet, will someday return the favor and enlighten us.